But if you can help me, yeah, don't worry. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to the audience now. I know a lot of you guys have a bunch of questions. So does anyone have a question? Not to be the teacher, but raise your hand. <laughs> My question is, what is your best advice when it comes to co-teaching with other teachers who aren't specifically special ed teachers or so when it comes to putting together an IEP or even a 504 and keeping it enforced? Because I know that a lot of teachers who weren't part of putting it together don't always keep it going and enforce it. For me to go? Oh, sorry. Um, we were told that January, months ago, the state may start requiring documentation um, that, we, I mean, they've talked about it for a long time, but now they're supposedly gonna push the envelope. They want documentation whether or not this particular child accepted this accommodation, this accommodation, this accommodation, this accommodation on their quizzes or their tests. And so, fortunate for me, I'm working with some seasoned gen ed teachers who are very good and very accommodating and they rely on me and I rely on them so it, it's a pretty good relationship but um, I just started doing something last trimester where a lot of my kids would not come out with me during homework time because now what they're doing in the uh, math classes if you will they leave about an average 35 minutes for these kids to work on their homework and so what I'm starting to do is I'm saying okay these kids that are failing my special ed kids I'm like, you're coming with me. And if they say no, I'm not gonna argue with them, I'm gonna document it. And then so I have running sheets in each folder for each co-taught that I'm in. And it's just every day and I got all the kids listed and I just, it's a check system if they decided to come with me or not. And then I got another one of those for uh, the quizzes and exams. And so if they refuse to come, I have it all documented. And so then if the state does come in, I'm like, here you go. And then I can also use the other information of parents, because the parents will be whistling Dixie that last week of the trimester. Why is my kid at a 42? Well, I sent you emails on this, 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 this day. I have this documentation that they're not, they're not coming out with me even though I asked them and we're not gonna bug them to because 16, 17 year old kids, it's on them. They have to take some responsibility and, and, and for their own education. And we always like to tell them at Big Rapids, they get the opportunity to do the class again. Um, and this is interesting, they can fail five classes in Big Rapids through their high school years and still graduate on time with their peers. The second they fail six, they're coming back either in the summer or they're coming back, well, coming back to us. After school, they have stuff running until like 4.30 in the afternoon. So, um, but it's a lot of collaboration and it's a lot of um, trust and our schools have, de they have department time, but we don't really have an opportunity unless we do it after school, which everyone's busy, or before school, which everyone's still busy. Um, but we don't really have an opportunity to get together too much to work. So if, if it's hit or miss, if we end up lining up at the same prep periods, we can get together and do that. But like I said, I've been blessed with um, some good seasoned teachers who, um, know what's going on and, and we talk all the time and so my one professor anybody real quick anybody have a mccullen in for math any math classes a mccullen mr mccullen uh yeah Matthew, right? yes yeah he, he is dynamite he's retiring from big rapids this year i'm very sad um and so he's gonna actually turn into full-time uh at paris but dynamite instructor and so i'm with him for geometry and so um yeah, it's gonna be a sad day when he leaves. We've been doing this for six years. And and whatever, it, 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 we work well. And so when he's in one area, I'm in the other, and almost like finishing our own, you know, finishing each other's sentences and stuff. So you you gotta work at it, it takes time. But once you get it, it goes back to the rewarding thing and it's just everything, it's like an amoeba. Everything's just kind of, one minute this is good, the next minute this, then it's good. And it's a lot of work, but it's fun. I think one of the things for me, um, while I'm not a teacher, as a special education social worker with um, the gen ed teachers that I've worked with and I was um, junior kindergarten through high school, is just trying to validate their concerns. We are asking gen ed teachers to do a whole lot. Um, from the time I started in education um, in 1994,
for till now. All educators, whether it's the uh, paraprofessionals, special ed teachers, your recess monitors, all of them, the tasks have increased. And I think just being able to validate their feelings and frustrations, because yes, you're trying to advocate and work together, but some of your gen ed teachers have five, six kids on an IEP and they all have different accommodations and they all have different needs. The other thing, um, and I use this in my classrooms here at Ferris, is universal design. Part of what we need to do better with gen ed teachers is to teach them creative design in the classroom so that instead of feeling like they have to differentiate for one, if you create um, your teaching in a certain way, actually all your students will benefit, not just the ones with an IEP. And so I think it's about teaching. And um, the nice part about younger teachers coming out, you're getting trauma-informed. You're getting the information about special education and differentiated instruction and behavior problems and behavior plans and FBAs, and that's, that's kind of my world. Um, but, and we're thankful, but even now, I work with teachers that have been a teacher for 30 years. They don't, they don't have that same background that you are getting blessed with because we know you need to learn this now. And so, but it's also just validating, it is hard. And the, what the schools are seeing now really is different. It's not, it really has changed and the need has increased and we are seeing that. So I co-teach all day, every day. It's literally my entire day. And one of the things, and I, and I work with seasoned veteran teachers and I work with rookie first year, second year teachers. And something I hear all the time, and maybe it's different here at Ferris, but gen ed teachers don't get formal instruction on how to co-teach, how to work with another adult. Raise your hand if you've taken a class on how to co-teach. There was a unit. Okay, so <laughs> raise your hand if there was a unit on how to co-teach. Raise your hand if you can tell me all the six different ways to co-teach. Right, okay, and that's kind of what I took. And that's totally fine. And he, But here's the thing when it comes to co-teach, right? And just to kind of mirror off of what these wonderful people are saying, one, it, there is a, it is very relational, right? You do have to get to know each other and figure out, get in where you fit in and, and get in where you end, right? But, and that does take time, okay? But before that can happen, you need to figure out what style of co-teaching you want to do, right? Is it a, and a lot of people, they, they assume co-teaching means we're both in the same room, we're bouncing off of each other, we're kind of riffing with each other, and I mean, that's the goal, right? That's where you want to kind of want to get to be, but you can also parallel teach, where you're pulling a group and you're doing it two separate, you know, in two separate rooms, or even the same room, you teach the same thing, right? There's a, one teaches while the other one supports, and you know, you kind of float around and see who needs help and offer support that way. That does not have to be the special ed teacher. The number of times that I've taught a math lesson while the math teacher's floating around, you know, we, we make it work that way. Um, so make sure you're well versed on what the different types and styles of co-teaching is. Um, and the next, another key thing is, and he, and he was getting at it, he said it, common plan, okay? If you have a good administrator who has the, is given the responsibility or has the leniency by the district to allow you to have common plan time, right? Take advantage of that common planning time and working together. Okay, and yes, you shouldn't have to do it before school or after school on your lunch, that is your own personal time. However, as a new teacher, I'm not gonna lie to you, you're gonna have to do it, right, until you figure it out. The number of times that I've had teachers over to my house for common plan and libations uh, is, is a lot, you know, because you wanna make sure you're locked in and understand the content area. Uh, and also, you have to acknowledge, and whether you're gen ed or special ed, you have to acknowledge that you're an expert in your area and that the other people are experts in their area. Being a special ed teacher, being a special ed teacher in my building, there's only four of us, right? There's only four special ed teachers in my building. So I am expected to be an expert in, in what I do. Now, when I was in my undergrad, I was really cocky, I still kind of am. And I, so I took that as, oh yeah, I'm the best, I know what I'm doing. No, that doesn't, that's not what that means, right? If you have a plumbing question, you don't call a mechanic, you call a plumber, right? So if I have a math question, I go to the math teacher. If I have a science question, I go to the science teacher. If they have a special ed question, they come to me. And so when you're co-teaching, you have to make sure you own your expertise. 
And your question was, well, how do you work co-teach with other people if they're not willing to co-teach or if they don't hold strong to the IEP or 504, right? You're gonna have to be assertive. Now, I'm not saying to be a jerk, right? You know, if you have all this documentation, take them that documentation and say, look, this is what Johnny is supposed to have. Here's how we're going to do it. Not a question. Here's how we're going to do it. Now, if they open the conversation and say, yeah, well, this way will work better for the flow of my classroom, yes, be open to, and be flexible, you know, to an extent about how that works, right? But make sure you own that this is my role. Now, if you're the gen ed teacher and, you know, the shoe's on the other foot, and it sounds like most of you will be the gen ed teacher, um, if the shoe's on the other foot, you're like, look, I know I've got four IEPs in this room. I don't know what their accommodations are. Or if I do, I'm, I know what they are on paper, but I don't really know what that means, right? Then speak up and ask, right? Speak up and ask and say, hey, I see that Johnny needs extended time. What does that mean? Oh, that means time and a half or double time or whatever it is. Make sure you get that clarification and make sure you document it as well. Okay? And the only way you're going to get that clarification is, again, common plan, working together, and, and seeking clarity for what that means. It, you should not be ashamed or embarrassed not to know, especially as a young teacher. Okay? I, at least at Western, the gen ed students take one special ed class, and that's it. And they're just like, hey, these are goals and objectives, and this is a plaque. And you're just like, okay, cool, right? <laughs> And don't ask me what PLAF stands for because I can never get it right, but I know what it is. Um, you know, and sure. <laughs> um, I have two special ed degrees, that's the one. Um, but so don't be ashamed to ask about, hey, I have Johnny in here, and this is what their accommodations are, or this is what their goals are. How can we work together to do that thing? Okay, just make sure you avoid the your kids versus my kids, right? Even now, I've been in my, in my school almost 10 years, I have teachers come to me and say, your kids need this. Well, no, they're also your kids, they're our kids, and this is what we're gonna do to work together, right? So if, if you're in the field of education and you're working with kids with IEPs or 504s, I've, I've yet to work with anyone who ignores that document out of malice. Right? I've never met a teacher who's like, screw that IEP, I'm not doing it. Right? I've never worked with, I've worked with professionals who've said, I don't understand it. Or I've worked with professionals who, who said, oh, I didn't realize they had one, you know, because maybe they're higher functioning or, or you know, their, their deficit area, their need area is in something that they're not related to, you know, ELA teacher, so they realize this kid with a specific learning impairment in math, right? So I've had that happen before, um, but really it's just, you have to make sure you're consistent, you're clear, and you're working together to make sure it's being enforced. And if you have a question about if it's being enforced with fidelity, then you can call that meeting and say, hey, we need to meet about this kid. It doesn't need to be an official 504 meeting or IEP meeting, but you can call that question, call that meeting and say, we need to meet to make sure this kid's needs are being met. Thank you again. Any other questions? I don't know. Um, so when you're teaching kids that need, you know, a different way of doing things, different way of learning, does a lot of the uh, intervention and making sure that they have the best Because I know that everyone can learn, and I'm just thinking the people that I've met, and anecdotally, a lot of the kids that I've seen in the high school age, they're getting the help, but I don't see their uh, old habits die hard, that sort of thing, where they didn't get help early enough, and so now they're trying to like put a band-aid on some broken dam, that sort of thing, like just trying to do whatever, but it's just not enough at that point. I think to your point, after being in an elementary school, I see what you're saying and, and it does change 
Um, but even how you qualify for support has changed. Um, now we use the response to intervention and the tiers of support. Um, but yes, to answer your question, there's some truth to that, that 